Welcome in. We're here in chapter eight, starting a new chapter on thermodynamics, thinking about the energetics of our chemicals and their reactions. In this first video, we'll be looking at enthalpy, the change in enthalpy for our chemicals as they undergo some reactions, including some Hess's law calculations and enthalpies of formation. Let's start here by discussing energy. So energy has the capacity to do work. It is everything in the universe that is not matter, right? Recall that matter is going to be things that have mass and take up some amount of space. Energy can be everything else. There are a few different types of energy. We can think about kinetic energy associated with motion, uh, which includes thermal energy, uh, based on the temperature. Other types of kinetic energy, we can have spinning, we can have vibrating, we can have translational motion, a few different types of kinetic energy possible. The other big category is potential energy, energy that can be stored within an object. This can be based on something's position. If you put it high on a shelf, well, okay, it can fall down and release that energy or it can be based on its chemical structure, energy stored within chemical bonds. This can also be something like electrical energy stored within a battery. Many types of potential energy are possible. When we are thinking about our energy, we have to obey conservation of energy. Energy is not going to be created or destroyed. What we have is what we have but we do get to convert from one type to another type. And in general, this will be true. Maybe we'll get to some exceptions in a few chapters when we're thinking about maybe nuclear chemistry, but in general, energy will be conserved. We can illustrate that here in our image. This is the Hoover Dam, right? If we're looking at the Hoover Dam, there's a lot of potential energy stored in the water up high. It has energy stored based on its position because it's at a higher altitude. There's that potential energy based on gravity. As the water flows down through this dam, it's converted from potential energy into kinetic energy, right? When something falls off a shelf, when water goes over a waterfall, we're converting from potential energy stored to kinetic energy as it moves down. The dam here is set up to harness that kinetic energy and turn it into electrical energy. We can pass that water through some turbines, spinning these around, generating some electricity, some electrical energy. In chemistry, we're going to study the flow of energy within our chemicals, within our reactions. In order to do that and to keep track of everything, we can try to define our system and our surroundings. We can define these however we'd like, whatever makes the most sense and whatever is most convenient. Oftentimes, our system is going to be our chemicals, our chemical reaction, perhaps. The surroundings can be maybe everything else in the universe. Or if that's too much, maybe it's just everything else that can meaningfully interact with our system. Maybe the solution and solvent that are surrounding our chemicals involved in the reaction, or perhaps the laboratory that we're doing this experiment in. Once we define our system and our surroundings, we can exchange energy between them. And in fact, there's only two ways where we can exchange energy. We can have a transfer of energy via heat, which we give the symbol Q, or we can transfer energy via work with the symbol W. In chemistry, we'll have a sign for heat and a sign for work, indicating the direction of energy transfer. Negative values for heat means that our system is giving off heat, exothermic. Negative values for work means that our system is doing work on the surroundings pushing against the surroundings. Alternatively, positive values for heat means that our system is 
endothermic, absorbing heat. Positive values for work means that work is being done on our system. We're pushing against our system. We can introduce our definitions. Heat, in terms of physics and chemistry, is a transfer of thermal energy, whereas work in physics and chemistry is going to be applying some force over some distance in order to move our object. We can look at this graphic here. Our system is whatever we define it as. Maybe in this case, it's our ice cube. Our surroundings is maybe the rest of the universe or maybe just the rest of the universe that can interact with our system, perhaps just the air and the table surrounding this ice cube. We can exchange energy between them. If this is a room temperature table with some room temperature air, our system, the ice cube, will absorb energy from the surroundings. We'll have heat exchanged from the surroundings into our system, right, from the air and the table into the ice cube and start to melt it. This process of melting is endothermic, absorbing heat from the surroundings. Maybe that's the only thing here. Maybe there's not work being done on our system or by our system, and that's fine. The two possible ways of doing this, heat and work. We can describe the total energy of our system as U. Capital U is the internal energy of our system. If we want to change the energy of our system, we can do that by supplying heat or doing work. We can end up with this equation, changing the internal energy of our system can be done using heat or can be done using work. Delta U, delta internal energy is equal to Q plus W. A useful way to describe the energetics of our system is going to be enthalpy. Perhaps this is review. We've seen this term enthalpy before, but we can look at it now. The enthalpy of a system is defined as the sum of internal energy and pressure times volume. Enthalpy as its own thing is given the symbol H. And so we can say H is equal to U plus P times V. This is a weird thing that's hard to measure, hard to determine exactly the exact enthalpy of our system. but if we're thinking about the change in enthalpy instead, delta H, this is something that we can actually measure much more directly. The change in enthalpy is going to be the change in internal energy plus pressure volume. And okay, if we have this delta on the outside of a parenthesis, we can actually distribute it in. The delta here just means final minus initial try to convince ourselves that this is true. If we have this change symbol around pressure times volume, we can't actually distribute that in unless one of these values is a constant. The delta symbol stands for final minus initial. If we fill in those values, E final V final minus P initial V initial. All right, this doesn't actually simplify unless we have something as a constant. The good news is, when we're doing our chemistry, you know, on Earth, exposed to our atmosphere, like we, you know, usually are, the pressure is relatively constant. The pressure is going to be approximately one atm at, you know, our sea level-ish altitudes. So when we're at constant pressure, which is usually a good assumption, we can actually simplify this down. The final pressure is equal to the initial pressure if it's a constant. When we're at this constant pressure, delta parentheses PV, well, is the same thing as pressure times the change in volume. This pressure times change in volume, okay, a little bit of physics here. This is our definition of work for pressure volume systems or things like pistons, where we can have a change in volume due to a change in pressure. In fact, this is our work well, with the opposite sign convention. If our volume is expanding, 
for our system. That means it is doing work on the surroundings. That means we have to have a negative sign here. All right, this is just our definition of pressure volume work, keeping our sign convention. We can also say here, okay, we're trying to define delta H. Delta H is going to be this negative work and our change in internal energy. Well, we know from our previous slide, the change in internal energy, well, we can only do that by doing heat exchange or work exchange. Delta U is equal to Q plus W. What we get here, delta H is equal to our delta U plus this P times delta V. Okay, this simplifies down. to this expression, Q plus W minus W. Well, this simplifies down even further. Our delta H, our change in enthalpy, is exactly just the amount of heat that is being exchanged by our system, at least under these conditions where pressure is a constant, which we said is a pretty good assumption when our system is you know, in equilibrium exposed to our atmosphere at that same pressure as our atmosphere. So for example, when we're doing a reaction in a beaker, which is just open to the air. Sure, it's at a constant pressure. And so the enthalpy here, the change in enthalpy has to be exactly equal to the heat exchange. This whole big derivation leads us to a very simple conclusion. If we wanna think about the change in enthalpy for our system, it's going to be simply the heat exchange, which is one reason why we like to think about enthalpy. It's not too bad to think about how much energy is exchanged via heat. This change in enthalpy, it can either be a positive value if we have endothermic processes. For example, that cold pack is absorbing heat from the surroundings, causing well, whatever it's in contact with to get colder as this reaction as this process absorbs the heat from around it. Or we can have processes that are exothermic, things that release heat. Maybe we're burning some fuel on our stove, releasing that heat, allowing us to you know, cook our dinner or whatever. Another way that we can look at this graphically, we can have our reaction coordinate, keeping track of the energy of our reactants and our products as some kind of reaction proceeds, maybe with or without a catalyst, great. We can label our change in enthalpy here as the energy of our products minus the energy of our reactants. We can measure this enthalpy for our reaction and we can use it in our calculations. Enthalpy here, change in enthalpy, it is a numerical value and it has units of energy. For example, here we have sodium hydroxide as a solid dissolving to form aqueous sodium hydroxide. This has an enthalpy of 44.2 kilojoules every time we do this reaction. For every one mole of our sodium hydroxide that dissolves, we have to put in 44.2 kilojoules worth of energy. We can use this as a conversion factor. If we have 45 grams of sodium hydroxide, we can figure out how many kilojoules of heat are absorbed. Our first step, we can convert to moles using our molar mass. And our second step, we can use our enthalpy in conjunction with our balanced reaction to convert over to kilojoules. Based on our balanced reaction, we have one mole of sodium hydroxide reacting which in turn absorbs 44.2 kilojoules worth of energy. Building that conversion factor using our balanced reaction, using our delta H numerical value. We have a second practice problem here. I'll put up the answer, see if you can get that and double check. This is the value that we should get. We can think about a few very specific processes and define the enthalpies for those processes. The first is going to be enthalpy of formation. Enthalpy of formation is defined as building one mole of our substance from its constituent elements 
at their standard states. The enthalpy of formation is the heat absorbed or released when we're doing that process. We like to have this enthalpy of formation because it can help us in Hess's law. If we recall, Hess's law says that if we have a series of steps in a mechanism that add up to some overall process, well, the enthalpies for those individual steps need to add up to the enthalpy for the overall process. If we have enthalpy of formation, we can have a very specific form of Hess's law. Let's take our starting materials in our reaction. Let's break them down into our individual elements. Then let's take our elements and use them to build our products. Those are the steps in our mechanism. If we add up the enthalpies for those steps in our mechanism, we get the enthalpy for our overall process. And we can maybe simplify this into a nice useful formula that's up here on the slide. We can look at this in practice. If we have C5H12, this looks like liquid pentane, we can write the reaction that corresponds to this enthalpy of formation. We're going to have to build exactly one mole of this pentane, and we're going to have to start with our individual elements. We have carbon and we have hydrogen. We need to think how does carbon exist in the standard conditions? Well, it exists as graphite. So we can write carbon as solid, or if you want, you might see carbon parentheses graphite. That's the most common state for carbon at these standard conditions. 298 Kelvin, one ATM of pressure, one molarity for our solutions. For hydrogen, hydrogen at standard conditions, standard states, exists as a gas, but actually it exists as a diatomic gas. We can write H2 gas. This is how hydrogen exists out in the world. In order for this reaction to be balanced, we need to add some coefficients. Five carbons react with six of our hydrogen molecules to form this liquid pentane. The energy exchanged when we do this reaction is our enthalpy of formation. Like we said, we like to use these enthalpy of formations to do Hess's law. For our second problem, we have this process, pentane, combusting with oxygen to form CO2 and water. We have a list of enthalpy of formations. We know the values for the enthalpy of formation of pentane, for gaseous CO2, for gaseous water. We can do our Hess's law formula here by taking all of our products and subtracting all of our reactants. When we're going about this, a few things to consider. We need to keep in mind our coefficients. We're not doing this enthalpy of formation once for CO2. We need to do it five times. So we'll multiply that enthalpy of formation for CO2 by five. Likewise, six for our water and, okay, just one for our pentane. Another note, the phases are going to be important here. The enthalpy of formation for liquid water is going to have a different numerical value than the enthalpy of formation for steam. Make sure that we're looking up the proper value from our handout of these enthalpy of formations. Another note, you might be wondering why we don't have oxygen included in this formula. Well, let's think about it. The reaction for enthalpy of formation for oxygen, we're trying to form one mole of oxygen from its constituent elements at their standard states. The reaction here would be oxygen gas turning into oxygen gas. How much energy is exchanged when we do this process? Well, it's exactly zero. The enthalpy of formation for a pure element, by definition, is just going to be exactly zero. One last note here before we crunch our numbers. If we want to be extra precise, we can include this little kind of degree symbol, the little circle symbol up on the top right of our values. That symbol implies that we are at standard conditions. 
which means pressures are one ATM, solutions are one molar, and the temperature is most likely 298 Kelvin. Okay, we have everything set up. Let's plug in our numbers and get a value. We get a final answer here, negative 3,020 kilojoules as our enthalpy for this reaction. Sorry for the typo before. This wasn't enthalpy of formation. This is the enthalpy for this overall reaction. This value hopefully makes some intuitive sense. It looks like we are burning pentane, which should be a combustion, which should be exothermic. We see a negative value here for this change in enthalpy which corresponds to our intuition. All right, that will wrap up our first video here, thinking about energy and enthalpy for our system, the surroundings, and any reactions that might occur. Thanks for hanging around. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you all in the next video.